For a little bit of history, the Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 93 years, the Strand is now the sole survivor. Now run by third gen owner, Nancy Bass Wyden. Under Nancy, the Strand is not only surviving in an increasingly competitive and unsure environment, but it is thriving. The Strand continues to famously hold over 18 miles of used, new, and rare books, and now hosts nearly 400 events a year. In large part, this is all thanks to you. Without our loyal community of book lovers, we wouldn't be here today. Tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome actor, writer, teacher, director, and songwriter, Jared Reinmuth. Jared made his acting debut in the 1994 Dionysian International Theater Festival in Veroli, Italy, in Karen Malpade's The Beekeeper's Daughter. Reinmuth made his directorial debut in, the 2016, in 2016 at the Theater for the New City's Dream Up Festival with Andrea J. Fulton's Rooftop Joy. His adaptation of Alexander Dumas' seminal masterpiece, Monte Cristo, debuted at the Hackensack Cultural Arts Center, and he began his writing collaboration with Frank Big Black Smith in 1997, while assisting his father, famed Attica attorney, Dan Myers, who will be joining Jared in conversation this evening. In 2017, at the suggestion of his friend and colleague, Patrick Kennedy, Reinmuth joined forces with co-creator and artist, Amazian, who is in France and unfortunately cannot be here this evening, composer, Alex Tishan, and another of tonight's speakers, Frank Smith's wife and former New York City social worker, Pearl Battle Smith. <laughs> All in order to fully realize the work initially started by Frank and the graphic novel, Big Black, Strand at Attica, or Stand at Attica, whoops. <laughs> Slip of the tongue. Stand at Attica, you can see the cover right there on the screen. Whew. Is it hot in here? Goodness. I promise that wasn't a plug, I promise. <laughs> Joining Jared, Dan, and Pearl in conversation tonight is award-winning author and Columbia University professor, Victor Laval. All right, without further ado, please join me in welcoming these speakers to The Strand. Hi, everyone. I'm Jared. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. Um, so this is a little bit free form right now. We have several things that we... Uh, would like to do, but I think to give some context, I'd like to start by reading, uh, since, since it's a graphic novel and I really won't be able to read pages like uh, we normally would probably, I, I do want to read uh, the introduction to the book, which I had the great honor to have my stepfather write, Dan Myers, uh, and I believe it's a beautiful introduction. So obviously when he writes in the first person, uh, it's Dan and it's Dan's voice. So just to give some context to the evening. This graphic novel is about real people and events. It is about a courageous, gentle person, a huge man with a booming voice. It is about people who were imprisoned at Attica, the maximum security penitentiary in upstate New York in 1971. It is about a rebellion for humane treatment is about the state's violent repression of an uprising that culminated in a bloody massacre committed by a police force that Dr. Clarence B. Jones, Attica observer and publisher of the Amsterdam News, called, quote, young, tense, and infected with racism, end quote. My involvement begins on the day of the uprising with a phone call from the prison to my law office. Here starts a personal and legal commitment that would last three decades. September 13, 1971 became one of the bloodiest days in modern United States history when New York State Governor Nelson Rockefeller ordered the violent retaking of Attica Prison. Troopers indiscriminately shot 2,000 rounds of ammunition at unarmed people trapped within the prison walls, resulting in the deaths of 21, 29 prisoners 
and 10 guards. After the shooting, stopped, police beat and tortured the surviving prisoners. One of the worst atrocities was the sadistic barbarism perpetuated by state police, per perpetrated by state police and guards against Frank Big Black Smith, the central figure of this book. To hold the state accountable, in 1974, on behalf of the 1,281 prisoners who were brutalized in DR that morning, I filed a federal class action civil rights damage lawsuit against Governor Nelson Rockefeller and other state officials seeking compensation for the wrongful deaths and brutalities inflicted against the prisoners. For an incredibly long 26 years, the legal team of lawyers, of five lawyers and innumerable dedicated supporters sought justice in and out of court for the prisoners who became known as the Attica brothers. Following his release from prison, Big Black began working for me and for other lawyers as an investigator for people charged with crimes. He had the ability to make people feel comfortable and forthcoming. He was intelligent, strategic, and charismatic, which made him an ideal investigator. At Attica, his communication skills and commitment to fair play were displayed as the prisoner's football coach. His stature and character were two of the reasons he was selected by the rebelling inmates to be their chief of security, and he certainly lives up to his reputation. No one was harmed for four days in D-Yard, including state officials, up until the massacre of September 13th. As you will see on the pages before you, because of Big Black's role running during the, ap during the up uprising, the state tortured him beyond what is imaginable. After his release from Attica, Big Black also became an early intervention drug counselor for addicted youth. At the time, early intervention, non-punitive treatment was innovative. In Brooklyn, he worked with high school youth in a vocational program sponsored by the United Auto Workers and had a close relationship with Sam Myers and other UAW officials. In his own case, Big Black was a riveting witness his testimony about enduring sadistic torture and brutality resulted in a unanimous jury verdict. He was awarded compensatory damages in the amount of $4 million, the largest jury verdict for a sole prisoner in the history of the United States. The judgment was wrongfully dismissed and all other verdicts nullified by an appellate court. In 2000, after 26 years and faced with no credible options, the Attica Brothers lawsuit settled for the inadequate sum of $12 million to be shared amongst the plaintiffs. Big Black was so magnetic and respected that the unfavorable trial judge invited him to his and his wife's home for a holiday dinner. <laughs> Upon hearing of Big Black's declining health, Daniel Callahan, former Captain 19th Special Forces Group, present at Attica and a witness at trial wrote to Big Black, Quote, today I am a better human being than I once was, and you have made me so. I have often asked myself how a person could suffer such brutality and remained optimistic and kind. As Big Black's wife Pearl testified at trial, she would often find him underneath their bed, shaking from a PTSD-induced nightmare. But with her loving support, he remained steady and generous. Big Black and Attica brother Akhil Aljundi were a driving force in the quest for justice. He remained close to all the surviving Attica brothers, especially Carlos Roche, until the end of his life in 2004. With the introduction of the archaic Rockefeller drug laws and for-profit prisons, mass incarceration has exploded. In 1971, New York State laid claim to 12 prisons and 12,500 prisoners. In 2000, when the case was settled, that number had ballooned to 72 prisons and 72,500 prisoners, ravaging poor communities of color and making the Attica prison uprising a story for today. This book, with its accuracy and visual depth, is an honest portrayal of those horrifying and tragic events, events which resonate in today's political climate. Frank Big Black Smith's story is an inspiration to my family, to Jared, 
to his siblings and his mom. And it will continue to inspire future generations. Thank you, Dan. Dan, would you like to? Yeah. Um, I'm just looking out to this audience, and those of you, and there are many, who did Attica support work between 1971 and 2000, please stand up. And since 2000, please stand up if you're doing justice work in your communities and elsewhere. A, um, just a footnote uh, to one little part of Jared's presentation, which happened to be my words, is that the person who called me from Buffalo, New York, and asked if I would be willing to do a civil suit, that they were too tied up, the lawyers were in Buffalo defending the brothers against whom criminal charges were brought. There was no civil suit. And Polly Eustace called from Buffalo and I don't know why I said yes, <laughs> but I said yes. And that's Polly Eustace. She Yay. made the call. <laughs> and that story is even more incredible because I literally served the complaint on minutes before the running of the statute of limitations. It was a three-year statute of limitations. September 13, 1971 was the massacre, which meant that September 13, 1974 was the last day you could bring the lawsuit. The case was brought the last day of the statute. And we had to do it because Polly called and we had to work long and hard to make sure we met that statute, and we did. And as you heard, it took 26 years of litigation in which we were very successful at trial. Frank Big Blacksmith received $4 million, which was not just for him, but was representative of some 40 to 50 other prisoners who were terribly, terribly, terribly tortured. Black was so terribly tortured, uh, you know, that Pearl's remarks, and she'll make them again, I'm sure, as to what it meant to have PTSD. By the way, every prisoner in D-Yard, the morning of the massacre and the time of the massacre, suffered PTSD. Unlike in Vietnam, where maybe two-thirds to 50% of the, those fighting in Vietnam had PTSD because they knew what they were there for and what was coming. The Attica brothers never expected this massacre. Never expected it. They knew that they'd have to go back somehow to their cells, but never expected an armed assault force. And that story is to be told, I guess, at some point. And there are those of you in the audience that know the story as well as I do. Um, yeah. Do you want to? OK. Now, I'm ready to turn this over to Pearl. Yay, hey, Pearl. Good evening to everyone that found it in their heart to come out this evening. And we thank you so very, very much. I would like to introduce Frank Smith's family. Sitting over here is his granddaughter and her husband. And I would just like for the Smiths to stand, okay? <laughs> Bravo.
You don't see them too. And when Danny talks about uh, in the book where I will wake up some nights and Frank will be up under the bed and he will always say, this couldn't happen to me here in America. And he talked about when they retook the prison and they all were nude up in Buffalo. You can imagine how cold that was. And he said he cut open a mattress and got between those mattresses to keep warm. And he would always say the struggle continues. He would always talk to young people about how they should manage themselves when they are come in contact with law enforcement, because it means a lot of your behavior. And he would, in the church that I grew up in, he counseled the youths in the church. And that was one of the main things that he talked to them about. If you're doing wrong, if you're doing right, if the police approach you, be respectful. Listen, whatever information they ask you, you give it up because it's more of them than you. And so we continue to do that in our church and I continue to do that in my work as a social worker and a substitute teacher. But we are very happy to have you here. Peggy, thank you. My nephew, Lorenzo, <laughs> and Frank's niece, great niece back in the back, and all the Smith family. We really appreciate you being here this evening. Thank and thank you, you so much. Should we do the video? To quick, yeah? We'll do the video at first. So Nick, yeah, you ready? So I'm just gonna set this up. This is a premiere of our video tonight. Um, this is gonna be the promotion for the book. It has original music by my, uh, my music collaborator and our, our music director, Alex Tashane. Uh, the video was directed by our dear friend, Bob Camp, uh, who it was the co-creator of Ren and Stimpy and had advised me from the beginning on this book. Um, and Jason Schofield is here. He's our editor and he's the one that put it all together, really. Jason is the one uh, that we all owe a uh, debt of gratitude to. And Patrick Kennedy worked uh, not only as the creative consultant on the book, but the creative consultant on the video as well. And I also have to credit Amazian uh, because he picked out art, uh, so I definitely, he is credited as our art editor. And uh, I really wish he could be here tonight, but obviously he's in Paris. And so, without further ado. Four days in 1971 changed the course of American history. This is the true story from the man at the center of it all. Big black, big black.
So now I'll uh, say a few words just to say hello and to say actually my job is the super easy job because I have nothing to add to the, what these three folks have to say. I'm just here to ask questions like I was an audience member um, uh, who got to ask the things that maybe everyone in the audience doesn't know about. Um, and uh, when the publisher asked me to join this, I jumped at the chance just out of complete respect for everyone here and for, I, uh, I was asking uh, Pearl backstage, uh, I had a hard time calling him Big Black. I had to call him Mr. Smith or Frank Smith. And she said, just call him Big Black. It's all right. But I'm still going to say just Frank. Yes? And so what I want to ask to start, um, since I'm not going to assume everybody here knows all the stories, is just um, how did you come to meet Frank Smith? And how did he enter your life? And could you talk to the audience a little bit about him and you for each of you? Well, I met Frank. I met Frank um, in Brooklyn. I was a daycare assistant teacher. And um, where we were, we had teachers in the, in, the, in the daycare. You know, we played numbers while we were working to make <laughs> extra money. It's the truth. <laughs> and so no one had the nerve to go to the number spot and put the numbers in, but they always wanted to play. So I would take a lunch, go put them in, and uh, the guy that was running the number place, he would come out, we would have the kids up on the roof at doing their recreation, and he would come out and he would do this here, and he would let us know us a one. <laughs> First number was the one. So he would come down and they wanted to play, so he would walk down and we just put the money in the bag and what we wanted to play after that and drop it in there. So anyway, uh, one evening on my way home, he told me to stop by, so I stopped by. So he said, I got somebody I want you to meet. So I said, oh, you know, I, you know better than this. His name was Rocky. So uh, I didn't go that day. <clears throat> So anyway, uh, he said, God still seen you. He said he want to meet you. So I went and I met Frank. And he told me, he said, uh, I'm going through all these indictments, and I need me a good, smart woman <laughs> to help me get through these indictments and help me get relaxed, because I have a lot of things going on. <laughs> so that's what he said. <laughs> so anyway, we exchanged numbers. He went to back to Buffalo. I was in, in Brooklyn. And he began, we talked on the phone, and he started coming down. And the first time he came to my, house for dinner, I think he called me about 15 times. And by the time he got there, dinner was cold. And that's how, that's how we originally met. And um, we had some bumps in the road, like all relationships are. But we managed to keep ourselves together. And he had a lot of work that he had to do during the time to deal with the indictments. And um, if he was here now and he could stand out and see all of you, it would just, it would just do something to his heart. And I'm just going to tell you one thing that happened when he was a drug counselor and one of the guys went out on his first job. No, went out, he got his first payment, um, paycheck. And he called Frank, he said, Big Black, he said, I just cashed my check, man, and I don't know what to do, and it, it looked like the drugs is calling me to come on and get high and all that. So Frank said, step outside the, the phone booth and look around you. So he said, Frank said, tell me what you see. He said, I see a shoe store over there, a clothing store over there, and all that. So Frank said, what you do? You go buy you some shoes, you go buy you some clothes, and save enough money for car fare for you to hop the bus. <laughs> and that, that's what happened. And so we had a, a lot of stories that 
he encountered along the way. Uh, we would be going to the subway, and the guy said, hey, man, said, I want something to eat. I'm hungry. So he would go in the restaurant, give the guy behind the uh, counter $20. He said, feed him, and whatever change left, just give it to him. Because Frank said, well, he might just want to get him something to drink or something. So he said, come on, man, come on inside, give the guy $20, told him to feed him, and whatever's left, give it to him. And he did so many um, acts of kindness to people. A lot of people he didn't know. And that that was one of the strong, strongest points of his life. He always wanted to share and just give it away. <laughs> and that was just, he, he was charming. He had a heart, and this book that him and Jared wrote, it's, a, it's the truth. And he wouldn't have it no other way but the truth. It's raw, it's heartbreaking, you laugh a little bit, you cry a little bit, but this is his story, this is, this is the truth. And when, they, when I first got the copy, Danny wife Joni called me, and she said, how you doing? And so I said, it's heart wrenching, you know. But this is what he wanted. This is what he wrote. And this is the truth about his life. And regardless of how some might disagree with some things in it, but this is from his heart and it's from his soul. All right. Uh, I met uh, Big Black because I was a member of the National Lawyers Guild, and it was the National Lawyers Guild that represented virtually every person in Buffalo who was a member of the National Lawyers Guild. There were prosecutions, of course, against the brothers. Instead of against the assault force, they prosecuted the brothers for crimes, and the defense lawyers in Buffalo were all National Lawyers Guild people. So it was easy for me to meet Frank Big Blacksmith because I was a member of the National Lawyers Guild. And we worked together um, through um, his illness on every aspect of the Attica lawsuit and other things that we did together. He was the investigator. For, for me and for other lawyers who were doing criminal cases, the best investigator ever because of the, the way Pearl describes him. That's how we would be with uh, witnesses and others. He may have been big, but he was very gentle and he was very good at getting information, very good. So I'm the second generation warrior in this fight. Um, and my mom, uh, that many of you know here, uh, who's a very, been a very important part, Joan Max Reinmuth, um, who is in Puerto Rico tonight. <laughs> I can't be here. But um, she tells the story of us playing as children in the living room while the events of Attica played out on television. And she vowed that day that if uh, if there was any way that we, our family could contribute and help and become a part of that struggle, that we would do it. And a couple years later, she met Dan Myers, uh, who was her soulmate. Bless you. And, uh, and Attica walked, the story of Attica and the story of Big Black walked into our house, and we were mesmerized. And uh, we all wanted to meet Big Black. Big Black was our hero before we had even met him. And I'll never forget when Pearl and their son Otis with, with Frank came to visit us. It was just one of the greatest events of our life. We were little kids, very Woodstocky, very <laughs> upstate in the snow. And uh, in 97, 1997, as these civil trials were coming to their fruition, and uh, Frank had won that $4 million judgment, I was assisting them in Buffalo and was a struggling actor <laughs> and went up to Buffalo to help out. And, uh, and Big Black and I, Frank, came up with the idea of trying to write a screenplay, a screenplay treatment it was going to be. 
and we'd ride around, and we'd eat in soul food restaurants, and we'd ride, he loved to, he was a, such a great driver, he'd drive you anywhere, and, and he would love to talk while he was driving, and it was just, it was just a, a magical experience, and then we'd go back to the hotel, and he'd go back to his room, and I'd go to my room, and I would write it out, I didn't even have a computer, we'd write it out longhand on legal paper, and then I went into his room, and I had to read it, and I was like, oh my God, am I, how am I, you know, it was one of the scariest moments of my life. And he got this wonderful, far away gaze in his eye. And I finished, and we both sat there silent. And he looked at me. His nickname, my family nickname was Joey, and he called me that. And he said, damn it, Joey, you got all that? <laughs> and I knew we were on. I knew we were going to do it. And, and much like the story of Attica in itself, it was twists and turns and winding roads and Pearl's been with us from the start and Dan's been with us from the start and uh, it took us a long time but here we are we made it uh, speaking of that uh, so along that uh Along the lines of the idea of the twists and turns, one of the things that I've learned is that uh, when people see a book on the shelf, uh, they think like the way it was when it, uh, it, the way it is on the shelf is the way it always was and was meant to be, and you just sort of snap your fingers and just put the book up there. Uh, and of course, that's not true. Uh, and I, so I wonder if you could just talk for a minute a little bit about that journey, like how it went from those times when you are all meeting him, uh, all doing this living together, writing this screenplay to now this graphic novel coming out. So, so the graphic novel, uh, I, as uh, I just got my introduction, my, my, uh, my adaptation of The Count of Monte Cristo had just run in the city at Urban Stages and had a nice successful run. And uh, like anything, you, you know, you're a playwright and you're getting some reviews and, you're, and, it, and it seems to be going great and everyone is loving it, but it just somehow and doesn't, doesn't go further. And I was speaking with my friend, Patrick Kennedy, who's here, like I said. And I said, you know, I said, I, it, it's been a while. And I, I feel like I have to take out Big Black Script. I have to try one more time. Mm -hmm. I owe it to him. Because the last thing we talked about uh, when he was dying in the hospital, I spoke with him. And he told me that Pearl was reading the screenplay to him. And he said he felt like he was watching a movie of his life. And he was. He felt it was beautiful, and I, he told me he loved me, and I told him I loved him, and I promised him I would not give up. And so I, I broke it out. I was living in the fourth floor, fifth floor walk-up on First Avenue with my four cats, and, <laughs> and coming to the Strand every day and to get inspired. And Patrick said to me, you know, Jared, I know you have your heart set on this being a, a screenplay, because uh, Frank loved movies, he loved movies, uh, loved westerns, mm -hmm. uh, had a great knowledge of film and, and movies, and uh, he said, I, I, know you, I know you have your heart set on that, but maybe we could get this made as a graphic novel. Maybe we could get this made as a graphic novel, and then you'll have something to shop as a movie. And I couldn't sleep that night. I was, I tossed and turned, and I knew he had sold me something so profound. And uh, we then went to, I came every day, I, I brought home books by Will Eisner and Scott McCloud and um, all my comic book guides and, and would read comic books, uh, uh, Coward by Ed Brubaker uh, and Sean Phillips. Um, and Patrick would, I would read the pages to Patrick, he would read the pages, and we were a gang of two until one day I came into the Strand, and on the second floor, I saw this book with a portrait of Muhammad Ali on it, and I ran across that floor and I grabbed it. And it was the only book printed in the United States by an artist called Amazing Amazian. And I immediately went home I immediately Googled him. I found a website. I wrote him, thinking he would never respond, like, who's this crazy guy from New York? He wrote me back right away. He said, this story interests me greatly. Uh, please send over the script. 
I sent him over the script. I sent him over some pictures of, of Frank and some videos. And he then said, uh, I'll, I'll read it over the weekend and I'll let you know, which of course I think as any, any aspiring writer knows, usually means you'll never hear back. <laughs> and which I assumed was gonna be the case. And he wrote me back that Sunday, then two days later, said, I'm your guy. And had his first drawing. And we... <laughs> and we embarked on a three-year three-year collaboration where we never spoke. We only emailed. Like internet dating kind of thing and we didn't want to break, we didn't want to break the spell. And we finally spoke uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Adam McGovern is here, who's a great writer in his own right, who interviewed us. And he's here tonight as well. And that was the first time we spoke was just uh, about two weeks ago. So. That's, that, and, and now, here we are. That's a real journey, yeah. So this is where we met, right here in the Strand. Yeah. Uh, in the book, uh, one of, there's a lot of uh, powerful stuff in there, but one of the most powerful things, I think, toward the end is the way that, uh, uh, if you haven't read it yet, the way you, you get to see the way that uh, everything that happened in 1971 stayed in Frank's life, in his body, in his mind, in his soul, uh, forever after really. And uh, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the idea, like people, even the book, you think like it says four days in 1971, but um, that events that big linger in people's lives for decades after, right? And I wonder if you could talk a little bit, each of you, about how Attica and the events in Attica have stayed with you since those four days. Well, for myself, um, at, at home, he would go through a lot of changes about what happened to him. And like I said, he said, this can't happen in the United States to a person. Because they never thought that the troopers would come in the way they did. And he would always say, this can't happen in America. He said, they're going to have to pay or something's got to happen from what they did to me. He didn't say the other guys at that time, but a lot of times he would wake up, he would be under the bed, and I had to talk him out, or he'd be in the kitchen and just in a hot sweat. And if you see him doing his legal work, I think that had a lot to do with how he would speak to a person that's been arrested or Danny them needed him to go and pick up a family and bring the family to the office. He knew how to approach, how to talk to a family, how to talk to a mother if her son had been arrested and all of that. And I, uh, there were a family upstate New York. They had a son away in college. And some kind of way, this kid wind up uh, in a place where they wanted to, uh, the parents to send money to return him back to the family. And it had something to do with snakes and all that. You remember that, Danny? Anyway, he never, he never met the family. All he did, everything he did was on the phone. And this, these people returned this kid back to his family without any money been, being given up. And he did all that on the phone. I mean, two and three days he was on the phone talking to the parents and talking to the kid where he, where he was and the people who had accosted him. And whatever, all the conversation was by phone, but he was returned home. And when he passed away, they wrote something like four pages of thank you for what Frank had did for their son. So a lot of times when he was out there, he knew exactly how to deal with a family or how to deal with a mother or father, and he would go pick them up bring them to the office, make sure they had something to eat. And then there have been times when people that, that he were dealing with, through all the lawyers that he was dealing with, were called, mother needed some food, 
We would go in the grocery store and shop and buy food and take to the house. It was a lot of things that he did that he was so thankful to be alive for what he had been through. So everything that he had, he would share it, give it away. It didn't matter whether it come back to him or not. That was just the way he was. Even before that, but once he went to Attica and came out and was alive, even though the mental stuff bothered him a lot. He did therapy and all of that, and you would say, you would look at him and say, hmm, he, he ain't no way in the world he went through all that. Look how charismatic he is. Look how forceful he is. And we would go on speaking get engagements all across the country. And nobody wanted to hear him but Big Black. We went to um, Berkeley, California, to the prison complex. And they had all these speakers there. But nobody, on, they only wanted to hear Big Black speak to them about what happened to him in his life and how he felt after what had happened to him. He continued to work and do everything he can to help anyone, any stranger, anybody. That was what his whole life ended with, being helpful. Just uh, to add a little to what Carol said. Use the mic. Everybody at DR, 1,281 people who were subjected to this incredible massacre. You know, that gas was dropped, and beh behind the gas, the armed forces shot indiscriminately, killing 39 people in a matter of minutes. Anybody that witnessed that suffered PTSD. Black particularly suffered ongoing PTSD because of the torture that was specifically given to him and continued for days on end and actually for about a year. Um, the thing about black that made him, to me, superhuman is that according to all psychiatrists and psychologists, etc., a person that was tortured as viciously and sadistically as black was has to be dangerous, has to be violent, has to be a threat to everybody and anybody. Black was never a threat to anyone. How he controlled the circumstances of suffering from PTSD is just incredible. We know he did it. Uh, act on it in, in his evenings at home with Pearl, winding up at the bottom of the bed. <clears throat> but he never acted out on people. And he was a champion of peace. <laughs> I mean, it was really incredible. Um, and the thing about what now, what now is whatever we take from that experience and other experiences in a society and a system that is approaching fascism. And its manifestations are even grosser, perhaps, today than they were in 1971, at least with regard to, the, to mass incarceration, at least with regard to the number of prisons that proliferate throughout the United States and New York State. That statistic, when the Attica Rebellion took place in 1971, there were mere 12 prisons in New York State and there were only 12,500 prisoners. When we settled the Attica case in 2000, there were 72 prisons and 72,500 prisoners. So we're dealing with a system that is bent on mass incarceration. And what do we do? Um, we have to oppose it, however we do that. And really interestingly, there is movement in, in New York to close Attica, shut it down. It can't be reformed. It can't be reformed. Attica has to be closed. And that's a movement that if you come across, it's worth supporting. I, I I want to add, because it, it was a strange period when he and I began writing uh, together, uh, because these guys had just won that $4 million judgment. So it, he, he, his life was 
I, th I think emotionally uh, changed. He was, he was then even able, uh, already an incredibly generous person. Now he was somebody that uh, just glowed. When you walked through Buffalo with him, I, I, there we were the funniest odd couple. I had just gotten back from Europe. I had my long, I was going through a Jim Morrison phase. I had my long black hair. <laughs> and there, there we were. Um, and everywhere we went, people just were drawn to him. And he was, you know, in a, in a different place because he had just gotten that judgment. And even though, you know, there was this inevitable sense of something was going to probably go wrong with, with that situation, there still was this sense of him, I think, in his own uh, person, a feeling that he had, he had accomplished something major by surviving and then staying with it all those years and leading that fight to that, to that type of judgment, which was extraordinary, Abs and still is extraordinary. Uh, and, and even if it was vacated, it was one of the most extraordinary accomplishments. And he was, he was feeling good at this period, and I think it really powered him for the rest of his days, and he, and he was just generous and loving and forgiving. He would even, you know, he would, the, the witnesses uh, for the um, troopers, et cetera, for the state, he would talk with them and, and get along, and, and they loved him. You know, hey, Frank, how's it going? It, it was just stunning. You, you just couldn't believe. He, 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 everybody loved him. Everybody loved him. And, and I'm just so proud that he lives with us in this book and uh, lives with us in our hearts. Uh, I could ask questions all night, but I would love to open up so, because I'm sure there are people in the audience who have questions that they want to ask. And we have some folks back there with a mic, if you can wait for them. If you just put your hand up or want to ask a question. Yes, good evening. My name is Rennie Smith. Um, I'm Big Black's nephew. Danny, I don't know if you remember me, but you used to represent me in 1977. My uncle introduced you to me when I was getting involved with, I had some problems with the law. I first met my uncle in 1974 when he was released from Attica. At that time, as I stayed, I was getting in a lot of trouble. I was one of my mother's problem child, and my mother told my uncle to talk to me. I remember it vividly when he came home, there was this huge party for him. But because there were so many people at the party, I was unable to get in, so I didn't get a chance to see my uncle that day. But the very next day, I see my uncle for the first time, this huge, big black guy. He takes me in a room and asks me what's going on with me. I was petrified, terrified. <laughs> Stumbling over my words to talk to him. What are you doing? What's going on with your life? What are you doing? What's going on with your life? That's all he kept saying. What are you doing? What's going on with your life? I didn't know what to say. He said, nephew, he will always call me nephew, never call me by my name, he will always say, nephew, you gotta get it together. But because my uncle had to recover on building, rebuilding his own life, he couldn't remain in my life. So I continue on with that negative, reckless, and selfish lifestyle. As I stated when I was 16, I used to get involved, I started going to Rankin Valley. I met Danny, my uncle introduced me to me, he represent me. In fact, he stopped me from going upstate at that time. But I continue on with this lifestyle, and one day I woke up in prison with a life sentence. I served 27 years in prison for something I didn't do. I mean, my uncle would come see me, and he would talk to me. And he would say, how do you feel? I said, I feel trapped. He said, that's right, what are you doing? You're trapped. He said, but you got to get out of here, because I still was getting in trouble when I was upstate. I was inside um, solitary confinement. And he said, nephew, you don't display the sign of an innocent man, because you double locked up inside a prison. How are you going to get out? He will always tell me, to try to get it together, try to get it together. He would always work with me. Me and him start talking about Attica. And I remember he told me that he was in a, in a laundry when they first took over the prison. He said, a call came to him. He said, I said, why did you go in the yard? He said, because it was the right thing to do. He said, I had to go out there because of the bitterness and racism that was going on in the prison. If he didn't go out there, he knew a lot of them guys out there would take advantage of the guards and probably kill some of them. So he said he went out there specifically for that, to make sure that these lives will be protected. 
He was proud. I, you know, I really love him. He helped me so much in my life. You know, today I try to follow in the footsteps. When I left prison, I said I want to leave prison as a fireman because I want to go out there and put that fire out in my community that I once started. Today I'm a New York State chaplain. Today I work for the office of crisis management, crisis, management, crisis management system, where I go around helping reducing gun violence in New York City. I am also, I am also one of the co-founders of an organization called the Families of the Wrongfully Convicted. As I just stated, I've been wrongfully convicted, so I go back and try to help other individuals get out. The social work and the human services I do, I do today it's a reflection of the work my uncle did that he wanted to steal in me so many years ago, but I couldn't see it, you know what I'm saying? And on Pearl, you know, I really commend you, I love you, and I just thank you, Dan and all y'all, what y'all continue to do, you know, for my uncle, because his spirit lives in all of us. And Attica. Uh, good evening. And congratulations on the book. Thank you, darling. I am curious to know whether or not the screenplay is still an option. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, is the screenplay still an option? The screenplay is definitely still an option, but it, it is going to, no doubt, uh, probably be taken over. Uh, but. Um, Boom has a first, what they call a first look uh, deal with 21st Century Fox. Uh, so every graphic novel that yeah. Boom publishes goes before them and, and they get first crack at it. So uh, obviously, you know, it's funny because here we all are, but the book isn't even officially released till tomorrow. So uh, we have a journey ahead of us. <laughs> um, I, I won't be surprised, but I, I'll, tell you, I'll say this, that I, uh, I'm very optimistic about also, you know, like I said, we wrote music, original music to go with this, to possibly uh, see it someday as a musical. And, uh, and I would love to see it as an animated film. So, you know, uh, you know with all of this incredible artwork, I'm, I'm hoping that perhaps something like that would happen. Do you have a question? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> On Pearl, I love you. I love you too. <laughs> I was always Uncle Frank's special niece. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be jealous, Clo. <laughs> On Pearl knows. <laughs> anyway, I remember good memories of my uncle. I was very special to him. Uncle Frank used to take me to all kinds of different places, concerts, I mean, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Uh, I went to see Diana Ross. Wow. I mean, I did a lot of things with Uncle Frank. And Uncle Frank was very, very dear to me. And when he did the Attica Upright Movement thing, um, I sung at the Billie Holiday Restoration Center in honor of my uncle. Um, I hold him dear to me. I really do. And I'm so honored to be standing here with my aunt today in honor of his book that she, she keeps his memory living on because Uncle Frank was extraordinary. He was very extraordinary. He was very special and smart. Oh, God. He was a very intelligent black man, and my grandmother knew it, and my moms knew it, and his wife most of all. She really, really pushed him. And I'm honored today, so I just wanted to say I'm the special chosen one. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing an incredible 
man's life and, and for all of you who have chimed in, it's so incredible. I feel like I could listen for hours, so thank you. And I, I uh, have a question about his legacy, which obviously, you know, multiple people in the room are already living and, and uh, you kind of alluded to this earlier briefly. Uh, I would just love to hear a little more if, if for anyone who, who knew him well up there. I think I'm kind of itching to hear what's, I mean, you can feel his energy in the room, right? And you can feel like the passion. And I, I also love what you said, Pearl, about how he would just touch his heart to be in this room. I, I would love to hear if, if you could channel that energy a little and your own passion for social justice, if you could speak to some advice on what you think he might say and what you would say are some ways that we as individual citizens who believe in you know, working on policy in, in any way that we can and using our power with people who make policy, if you could speak to what are some ways to live on his legacy. Well, I worked for the Department of Juvenile Justice uh, for 14 years up at Spofford with juveniles. And so, um, what we need to do is continue to channel all our efforts toward our youth. And we need to educate our youth. Your grandson, your niece, your nephew, whoever. We have to continue to channel everything that we have within us to support them, educate them on the criminal justice system because it's easily to fall right in the crack of, of the criminal justice system and mom be wanting to mortgage her house, she want to go mortgage her insurance policy, because we've seen all of that during these years. So what I can only say to you is look at the youth. Take them by the hand, bring them to the library, bring them to the bookstore, find out what they like to read, find out what their interest is. Even though it may not be your interest, find out what their interest is, and you can work with them and educate them on how they need to grow up and be productive citizens. Other than that, you're going to lose them. And if you have a, a child that's bisexual or whatever, you got to embrace that. Because if you don't embrace it, you're going to lose it. So the best thing to do, whatever problem your child has, embrace it, seek help for them, and always let them know that you love them, regardless of what they do. I, I just, uh, from an activist uh, point of view, I uh, have been very inspired by the abolitionist movement in this country. Uh, and to see, to use the language of abolition when we're talking about mass incarceration, uh, when we're talking about unjust, unjust policing methods, uh, stop and frisk, which was something we had to, we had to fight right, on the, right in New York City, you know, New York City. And uh, things like that. And, and so I'm very inspired always by the work of, of Dr. Angela Davis, of course, who has really been the leader in this movement. Uh, she's depicted in the book. She testified with uh, Frank at the confirmation hearings of Nelson Rockefeller. They both went up there and took a stand against him. And uh, that's depicted in the book as well. And, and that's where I'm getting a lot of my inspiration from. And I would certainly add to it that I know that at the end of his life, uh, some of the stories about Abu Ghraib were coming out at that time. And he was, he was very uh, animated uh, by things like that that, 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 that we finally stand up and say, no, we don't torture. So, so, so there are plenty of things. Um, plenty of things going forward, and, and those are some of the things that I stay interested in. We have time for one final question or comment, if there is one. Actually, yeah, let, let's do this now. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much for coming down, everyone. I'm Patrick Kennedy, the creative consultant. Uh, I just wanted to tell you all that you can find us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Stand at Attica, all one word. Uh, please follow us, retweet us, uh, uh, so on and so forth. This has absolutely been an honor being here. Just also wanted to give uh, quick credit uh, our voiceover.
started by uh, Mr. Carrie Means, uh, who many of you may know as the voice of Frylock on Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Um, and um, uh, the horn section uh, was provided by Professor uh, James McElwain, who's in the audience. Please stand up. Um, Uh, and I got one little bit of good news. We are number one new release on Amazon for uh, biography and historical graphic <laughs> books. And uh, uh, thank you so much for um, allowing me to fulfill a lifelong dream of being a comic book creator and having my name in a book like this is an honor that I cannot describe. And um, thank you once again. Thank you for coming. That seems like a good point to wrap <laughs> on. Uh, can we get a round of applause one more for all of our speakers this evening? Jared, Pearl, Victor, Dan, thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you everyone for coming tonight.